Hello and everyone, welcome. Thank you for coming to Startup Grind Wilmington. Startup Grind Wilmington is a program by the Goldie Beacom College Entrepreneurship Club and Doctor of Business Admin program. Thank you to Delaware Innovation Space for hosting us and thank you to our co-sponsors, the Delaware Sustainable Chemistry Alliance, the Division of Small Business and the Small Business Development Center. Startup Grind is about bringing together the entrepreneurship community of Wilmington and beyond to showcase the successful founders like Santiago who are doing great things in Delaware and expanding their sector right now. So Santiago is the co-founder and COO of W7 Energy and just want to really get started with this. So when did you start becoming, say, a scientist or an entrepreneur and which was first and when did those start to like, overlap in your mind? I think they started at the same time. Um, I consider that the entrepreneurship part started when I was still in high school. I used to sell candies at school and then get that going so I could have some money for my, my expenses, my mm -hmm. personal expenses. And then a scientist, I was interested in engineering uh, pretty early in high school. Uh, initially, I was thinking about going for mechanical engineering, but then knowing that everything was going towards the field of nanotechnology and new smaller things, I decided to go into chemical engineering. So I would say they started kind of like at the same time, mm -hmm. and that's how things happened. Okay. And for university, were you always planning to go the science path, or was it a decision between more of the business and entrepreneurial and the science? Oh, it was always a decision to go for both. So even though I started doing chemical engineering, I always had my, my kind of like my side in the business side. Mm -hmm. So I always took some business in the, some classes in the business school, and that way I started getting some business acumen. Okay. And what did you start to see those two start to come together a little bit? where it's not just separate of like, I'm making money to cover my expenses in high school and just making money on the side, and then the passion is the science. Like when did those start to really come together? They started to come together in my senior year um, mm -hmm. of college. Um, I was part of a class that was kind of like promoting entrepreneurship, something like what you're having. And the idea was to present a business plan. Uh, so I started looking at different, different activities that were going on and what could I start a, a business on? And I remember a friend that had once told me that electronic waste was a big deal and that was kind of like a, creating a, a lot of contamination throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, well, um, I'm a chemical engineer. I can maybe do something about it. I can maybe understand what's going on there. So I started looking initially with the idea of recovering maybe precious metals, gold and stuff from processors. But then I realized that maybe, maybe a business idea was in the recovery of the precious materials in the lithium ion batteries. So at that moment, I, I figured out that that was a big issue. Uh, that was roughly 10 years ago. And I started developing a business idea around that, about recovering that cobalt lithium and other metals from the lithium ion batteries and then recycling into, again, the materials to build the same. Mm -hmm. And how far did you take that? Did you continue with the business plan or did you just cut it off to the school? Um, I continue with, with the business plan. Um, I managed to raise some money and that's how both things got integrated uh, to fund the research uh, as my thesis mm -hmm. as an undergrad student. And I managed to do some, some work on that. And then in my last year, um, I went for an exchange to the University of New Mexico and I, I had to put that on hold. Mm -hmm. So I went there, I started doing a different type of research uh, in the professor that welcomed me to be there. And uh, I put that on hold and then I ended up staying in New Mexico I keep working a little bit in the, in the business idea, but then mm -hmm. I realized that during that year and a half that happened in between, there was another couple of big companies that took that space, so I decided to, to stop doing it. So you decided to not pursue that because you saw there were competitors that were too large and you weren't yes, going to... Yes, yes, yes. At the, moment, at the moment that I started looking at the business idea, there were only a couple and they were just starting to do efforts. Mm -hmm. But then after a year and a half, it was already occupied by pretty big players. Gotcha. And then what did you start on working at the University of New Mexico? I started working catalysis, uh, electrocatalysis for fuel cells. Mm -hmm. So it was development, characterization, kind of like uh, getting a better understanding of new technologies that would enable a greener future. So of course, completely from the technical perspective, uh, doing research. And I was pretty fortunate to be with a professor that was very industry focused very application focused and um, he, always, he always kind of like imparted me that idea that okay whatever you're doing what's the real application behind it and what are you going to do with it. Mm -hmm. And how challenging is that to look at your work and something that you're passionate about and then trying to turn it into okay how is this applicable and then also commercialization how is this going to be profitable down the road. 
it is challenging because you look at everything from a two scope kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You're thinking as a scientist and you're thinking as a business person. Of course, at the time I, I was, and I'm still learning a lot about business, uh, but of course I was, I was very green in that and I, I just kind of like had some ideas, okay, this is a great idea, but then it ended up being no, not so good because there were some aspects that I didn't consider. Uh, but it's of course, to answer your question, all the time that, that changing and changing the point of view because something might be really cool from the technological point of view but doesn't work from the business part mm -hmm. and the other way around. But in the flip side, then whatever you look at it, um, you already have a better understanding of how are you going to apply it and how are you going to use it at the end. Yeah. Do you have some examples of work that you pursued then realized that it wasn't going to play out down the road? Oh wow, that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> of course there's, let me think. That's a, that's a hard question. In your research at the University of New Mexico, like anything that you like, were looking to maybe turn this down the road into a career and commercialize, but then you realize that perhaps it's not going to pan out? I would answer this question saying that you never know if you're going to be able to commercialize it. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, you start working on it, and then you kind of like, if you, well, if you, if you from the get-go see that there's no, no idea, then why do you keep working on it? Mm -hmm. It may be for the love of science, and maybe you'll be discovering something real cool that will enable another thing. But my approach has been like, if I don't see the real application behind it, then, then, then I don't feel as passionate about it. Got it. So, of course, I have been putting the effort because you need to put the effort anyway, and then see if things are going to pan out or not, mm -hmm. because there's right. uncertainty. Yeah. So let's backtrack just a little bit. You mentioned that you raised money for your idea for the com lithium waste, excuse me. So what was that process like of going out and trying to get those grants? Oh, it was really, it was really interesting. The government, and these are the kind of money that you can tap everywhere. The government was looking to fund research for undergrad students. Mm -hmm. And um, I came across it, I think, to one of my professors. I, I went and I pitched the idea, okay, I said, like, I want to start a company around lithium ion battery recycling. Mm -hmm. And he was, this is really cool, but how are we going to fund it? I don't have a current project on that, so how are we going to make sure that you get the materials, you get access to equipment, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So we started looking at ideas and looking at ways to get that. And then we came across to this, with this grant from the government, from, from the Science and Technology Department of Colombia. And um, we built the proposal, we said, submitted the proposal, and then we got accepted. And it's, that's how, how we did it. Yeah. And that's where the business background came very in handy, I'm guessing, of putting that proposal together. Yes, yes, well, yes, yes, yes. So back to the University of New Mexico. So when did you keep rolling with that? What was the next step for you? So. I went to the University of New Mexico. I started doing the PhD. Uh, I, did, I continued to work in electrocatalysis, and I saw that, okay, the batteries maybe was not the, the moment mm -hmm. uh, for me to start a company with the lithium ion recycling. Uh, but then, of course, now I start working in fuel cells, and fuel cells is the new way that energy will be produced and mm -hmm. all around the world in a green way. So I started looking at opportunities and chances that I could build a business around it. I took a couple of classes in the business school, and then I partnered up with a, with, a, with a guy from an MBA, from the MBA program. And then we start talking, and we start pitching ideas. Okay, what can we do? How can we do with technology? And again, um, we started, well, part of that class was to make a business plan uh, for the technology business plan competition in the University of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And one of the conditions was to use a technology either from uh, the university or from one of the national labs we're, um, that we could, we could have access to. So we started looking at the, portof a por at the portfolio of the technologies. And then funny enough, uh, I found a technology from uh, my PhD advisor that was pretty interesting. It was a new type of fuel cell that used uh, enzymes to produce electricity mm -hmm. in very small scales, very small, uh, very small power, demands, yeah. power demand uh, electronics. So then um, I started with my co-founder to pitch ideas, what can we use it for? We went through, I don't know how many, well, how many iterations on the business idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, we eventually uh, realized that there was a good match. In Africa, there was a lot, and there's still a lot of cell phone usage, and there's a lot of people off the grid. So this was a, this was a good match because these uh, biofuel cells could use sugars to produce electricity from oxygen in the air and sugars in the, in the fruits or the, um, for example, sugar cane or sugar beets. Mm -hmm. So we built a whole business, plus, business plan around it. And um, 
but yeah, that, that, was the, that was kind of like my continuation of the business path with yeah. the technology at the same time. Yeah. Just for the people who don't have a science background, including myself, can you just explain a little bit what the fuel cells are and how the enzymes are different than what's commonly on the market? So the fuel cell is, the fuel cell is a way to convert the chemical energy mm -hmm. into electrical energy. Uh, you can have different, uh, different types of fuels. You can have hydrogen as a fuel, you can have sugars, you can have alcohols. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you put these fuels in, you take oxygen, it could be either from the air or you can have oxygen from the tank, you make them react in some type of catalyst and then you produce electricity mm -hmm. and some other products. Yeah. Um, what was the second part of the question? <laughs> <laughs> and how is that? What you mentioned of using the enzymes, how is that different than what's commonly being done right now? Oh, excellent question. So one of the biggest difficulties or hurdles that fuel cells have to overcome is the cost of the catalyst. Mm -hmm. So the catalysts are usually precious metals, and these precious metals are very costly if you were thinking about the, the space program used fuel cells, and they were able to power the systems that took us to the moon. Mm -hmm. But then if you were thinking about a mass application as powering cell phones in Africa, then you need to start considering really the cost of these devices. And these enzymatic catalysts, pr when produced at scale, could have uh, generated these fuel cells uh, for markets that cannot afford higher prices. Yeah. So then, that was the difference. Got it. And that's why, hence Africa, so it's generally a lower GDP and that's like the mass market with yes. the cell phones. Yes. And you're yes. doing fuel cells for like on the micro scale, like in for cell phones? Yes, for, okay. for cell phones. The idea was to have a external fuel cell that would power the cell phone. It is pretty interesting. Uh, when we were doing the business plan, we realized that there were like 485 million people in the sub-Saharan Africa that didn't have access to the electrical grid. And like 70% of the population is cell phones. The, the way they use cell phones in Africa is amazing. That They, would, they make tra financial transactions, uh, they browse the web for even for example, you want to sell a chicken and you want to know what's the market price of the chicken. If you live in a remote village, what you do is you check in your cell phone what's the price of the chicken and then you're able to sell it. Or you want to plant your crops, you do the same. So, for example, there are some places that do not have access to cash. And they have money, but they don't have cash. So the way they transfer the money is through the cell phones. Yeah. So this, was, this could be a technology enabler uh, for the people in Africa and people gridless. Yeah. So what, just explain that a little. What do you mean by like off the grid? If they got access to a cell phone, like what's the difference there? <laughs> Excellent question. So many of these people that have cell phones but live off the grid, they have to walk to the next town, or they have to get, they have to go to somewhere where they have, for example, a solar panel because it's a pretty expensive uh, system for someone that, whose income is so low as yeah. this is some cases. So they would have to go be in the cell phone charging station, wait a couple of hours, or leave and come back, and then of course not have the cell phone. Yeah. So that's how there can be people with cell phones without access to a grid. Gotcha. So then having that little charger that they can use and have anywhere would essentially put them on the grid and then they can use it wherever, and even in their own little vid village. Even better than putting them on the grid, they would have their own power system in the house. Perfect. So you basically, and that's, that's something that is happening in some places, there's no more need of, of grid. Most of us don't use the landline anymore, right. and that's kind of like a new trend. It's just everything, everything is kind of like distributed power systems and distributed communication systems. Okay. So you realized there was a market in Africa, so you're developing the fuel cell. So what was the next step? The next step is we start pitching and mm -hmm. we start trying to find, find, find two things, and that's kind of like, that was my outcome of that, that effort, battery. rate, um, is that you need the right people and you need the money. You need the money to get the things done. So we start pitching around. It was uh, by my business partner and I looking for sources of capital that would found this really far-fetched technology because it was, and I have to admit it, it was a pretty low TRL, low technology readiness level, technology that needed some significant funding and some significant expertise uh, to, to make it happen and turn it into a, a product. Mm -hmm. So we start looking for those things, those two things, and then, um, yeah, we tapped into different sources. Uh, we participated in the business plan competition in the University of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. We won second prize and then we got some funding to license the technology that was super important because if you want to be a, a company in the technical field, you either, want, you either want to have like a really solid technology and solid IP or you want to have a really quick team to develop the software that you will be doing. That's yeah. kind of like the, the way I look at it. Got it. So. So yeah, we started tapping into this money. We, we started developing the technology, making partnerships. We raised a couple of more uh, 
uh, tens of thousands of dollars at the end. At the end of the program, well, at the end of the company, we, we raised like $90,000 that we use for more technology validation. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, my business partner and I realized that we needed much, much more money and we needed much more people to do that. And it was difficult because I was in the middle of the PhD and he was in the middle of the MBA and we were kind of like, yeah, yeah. we had too much in our hands. Divided attention yes, for both of yes, you. Yes, 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 yes. So how did, how did you go about building your team? Because that's very important for startups to have the right people in the right places to make it work. Yes, building the team. I would say that's the most important thing. Yeah, it's, I, I, that's what I learned. You want, to have, you want to have a team of people that you can work with, you can rely on, and you want, you can basically say that whatever needs to be done will be done. So building the team, uh, I basically met um, in the class, in the class that we were taking together. And we talked and we went through the process, we went through the business plan, of course, there were a lot of frictions at some time, which is completely natural. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, you basically, you basically need to meet a bunch of people, interact with a bunch of people, the people that you feel that you have a good match, interact even more. Mm -hmm. One thing that helped us a lot was the startup weekend. We went one whole weekend and we, we went through so many different ideas. And that's how we ended up with the Africa cell phone charging idea. So I would say that just, Talk with a lot of people, interact with a lot of people, and then with the people that you feel that you have a good match, just spend time together yeah. and try to figure out if things work out. Yeah. And what specifically did you look for in people to bring onto your team? What is specifically? I think it's the attitude to work. You want to have people that is willing to work and is willing to do what needs to be done. It's, I think that's, I would say that's the most important thing. Yeah. So you got some funding from the business plan. What were some of the other areas that you got funding from to keep it rolling? We got uh, some funding from the New Mexico Small Business Institute. So this was some funding that would allow that allowed us to partner with Los Alamos National Lab, and that's where the technology validation happened. Mm -hmm. So this was a pot of money that would be transferred to scientists in Los Alamos, and then the scientists in Los Alamos would do the technology validation and then make some. Um, improvements in the technology and then would give it back to us as a report like, okay, this is what needs to be done in order to make this technology commercially feasible. Yeah. And uh, a couple of pla other places that we tapped also for funding, uh, we went, um, we were pretty fortunate to apply for the uh, business plan competition in the Rice University mm -hmm. and we also got some funding from there. Of course, we got a lot of uh, feedback, amazing feedback from very good uh, venture capitalists and also we got some funding from there. Um, and we also get, of course, some um, access to connections. Yeah, that as well. Wonderful. And so you're still based in New Mexico at this time. Is that correct? At that time. At that time, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> so when did the, when was the next time? When was the transition over to moving the base to Delaware for W7? So after working in the company for roughly two years, mm -hmm. uh, my business partner and I decided that okay, and this this was a this was a break point that I forgot to mention before. Um, there was another pretty good competitor that came into the came into the into the picture. Mm -hmm. It was basically a dynamo that you would hook up to a weight. The weight would go down, and then you would be able to use it to recharge cell phones. So, pretty simple. Yeah. The price point was amazing. So we realized, okay, we can we cannot compete against that. And that was that was kind of like the point that we said, okay, we don't have time. There's a better there's a better solution. Let's move on and do our next thing. Mm -hmm. So I finished the I finished the PhD. And then I got in contact with Yu Shen Yan, who is a professor in the University of Delaware. Mm -hmm. And he told me that he had this project uh, to develop a new type of hydroxide exchange membranes that could enable affordable fuel cells. So it was a pretty good match. Yeah. I realized that, okay, this is a good match. This is what I have been doing the PhD on. Um, here is Yu Shen that has a clear interest in the science and a clear interest in the business. So it was a, it was a, it was a perfect match to do it and a perfect transition. So I came to the University of Delaware as a postdoctoral researcher. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in this project, uh, developing the technology further, uh, developing it more as a product, and of course, working as well in the business aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, this was a project funded by the uh, RPI of the Department of Energy, and this is an agency that is focused on that technology transition aspect of the, of the, yes, of the technologies. Yeah. So um, that was one of the requirements. We worked pretty hard in Yushan's team. Uh, to develop the product, develop the business case, and then that's how I ended up here. Yeah, and that was the formation of W7. Yes, yeah. yes, W7 was formed 
uh, as a spin out of the University of Delaware mm -hmm. uh, based on the technology that was developed in Yushin's lab. Yeah. And wh where did you come up with the name W7? Oh, that's an excellent question. There's no, <laughs> there's no real meaning behind the main name at this <laughs> moment. It was just like spare the moment and just like pick a letter and pick a number? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And then, so you spun it out and then what was the next step of moving along with the research? The next step to move it along with the research uh, was still, still uh, in the University of Delaware, of mm -hmm. course, to start looking for ways to fund this new spin-out. Uh, while working in the university, we started applying for different funding sources. One of them was the Blue Hand Proof of Concept. Uh, the other one was the, uh, a continuation grant from the RPI mm -hmm. DOE <laughs> Department of Energy. Um, to yes, to continue to co to fund the continuation and the scale up yeah. of the of the um, of the technology. So that's that's what we did. And when did you move into right here at the Delaware Innovation Space? We moved here on January 2019. That's that's when we moved. Um, yeah, that's when we moved. Uh, uh, Lan, our C CTO, mm -hmm. Chief Technology Officer, uh, moved here uh, as a participant, as a lead of the blue hand proof of concept which we got from the University of Delaware and then he started doing some operations here some scale up some testing some customer validation mm -hmm. and then on May Lan and I moved here uh, full-time so that was kind of like the, the, the big move okay we're going out of the university and we're going to go full-time and work in W7 Energy yeah and you're the COO of W7 yes so what does your duties as COO include my duties as COO is coordinate uh, the different aspects of the business to keep mm -hmm. the business progressing and running. Uh, I'm also um, in charge of having a constant communication with the customers. Uh, we're a very consumer-centric company. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly sending, we, we send internationally to different companies, to different labs, to get feedback on that, on those products that we're developing, and then integrate that feedback in our product. Yeah. So that's one of the, the, key, the key things that I'm doing. And then, of course, yes, managing the, the little details of the business itself, the daily running of the business, yeah. like different aspects. Yeah. yeah. And who are your typical customers? Our typical customers are fuel cell companies that are making different types of fuel cells. I said that there's hydrogen fuel cells, mm -hmm. but there's other types of other type of fuel cells that use other type of fuels, and then also electrolyzers. Electrolyzers is a device that work backwards from a fuel cell. You put mm -hmm. energy and then you obtain hydrogen and water. And you're thinking, why do you want to do that? Well, because then you can connect that device to the grid, you have very affordable or free power, and then you produce the hydrogen that will later on be used to utilize for the fuel cells or the, to clean up some industries. Yeah. And what's your pitch to them when you go to them with your product? Our pitch is, and this is our key competitive advantage, is that we enable significant cost reductions. So one of the reasons why these devices are not mass applied is the cost. As I mentioned, the catalyst is one of them. Mm -hmm. And then the construction of the devices themselves, they require pre-specialized materials. Well, our membranes that go within these devices enable material replacement that will lead to cost reduction. That we're showing that we can obtain these cost reductions. So this is, this is our biggest selling point and we have the best type of membrane of this class in the market. We already pre-scale up, that, that's a pretty important point. Uh, we are producing it in an industrial setting and we have a lot of validation and traction. So this is, this is the pitch, this is the summary of the pitch. Excellent, and where do you see the next year and 12 months of W7? What do you see that looking like right now? Looking like we keep working very focused on the product development mm -hmm. and then feedback from customers. So some of our customers have indicated, okay, we want this thickness for this specific application and we have been laser focused on those type of feedback. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're also scaling up different processes uh, for the pro that go into the product, into the final product production. And then of course, business development. We want, we want to become pretty, f we want to become profitable as early as we can, so we're working hard on that. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that you got some grants, and then recently you've received grants from the Division of Small Business with the EDGE program, and then also the Department of Energy. So let's walk through what that process was of applying and then receiving those grants. Okay. Uh, the process of applying for those grants um, is 
for let's just start with the Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was uh, a grant that was very specific for our 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 product. Uh, the Department of Energy identified that hydroxide exchange membranes, which is our product, mm -hmm. uh, are critical for enabling these fuel cells and electrolyzers in mass implementation. So we started crafting the proposal. Of course, this, this is a team effort, many people involved on it, and then we identified, okay, this is how much money we need, this is what we can do with this money. We created a plan, we submitted it to the Department of Energy, and then we managed to get it. And then for the EDGE grant, um, this, this is a fantastic grant from the state of Delaware. Uh, we identified that there were some expenditures that were not allowed uh, in the Department of Energy grant that we got, and we needed that money, mm -hmm. and this was a perfect way to do it. So we applied um, for the grant. Uh, we, of course, got a lot of input from our team and also externally from the entrepreneurial ecosystem um, in Delaware and that enabled us to craft a pretty good proposal that we went and presented in front of the Edge Grant uh, judges. Excellent. And did you receive any other funding besides those two recently, and how did you go about getting those? Um, apart from that, we also got the Blue Hand Proof of Concept mm -hmm. uh, money from the Horn Entrepreneurship Program, and we also got the Unidale, a Unidale Foundation grant. Um, to get that one, it was a similar process. We identified, and this is, this is something that I forgot to mention before. You want to be very specific about what do you want to do with the money. Mm -hmm. You want to be very targeted. Okay, if we get this money, what do we want it for? In the, in the case of the Edge, it was specifically for rent and some equipment that we needed. So we did the same for the, for the Unidel grant. We crafted a proposal around that specific need that we have. And this, is, this will be something, this will be kind of like another, another lesson that, that we got is that, well, I, I will say that I personally got, is that you want to be, you would want to identify what you really need to do and how much money do you need to do it and then find a good match. Because, for example, for battery, the fuel cell company to provide um, uh, cell phone charging from Africa. It was too much money that I needed for what I needed to do for the product development. Mm -hmm. Whereas in W7, we have been extremely focused. Okay, we need this specific equipment. We need this <laughs> specific thing to make the product happen. Yeah. And then that's, that's the money that we'll get. And then that makes your, your proposal stronger. Got it. And what other advice would you give to science founders for raising money in those early stage? Don't be too attached to your ideas. I think that's, that's kind of like a, like a constant uh, trait that I have seen throughout. You want to be flexible. Of course, once you are seared in, in the idea and you have identified that it's a really good idea, you want to stick to it. But you also want to be flexible. You want to listen to your customers. You want to listen to the feedback. You want to listen to what people on the market are telling you. If the market is telling you that, okay, things maybe are better not that way, listen to that. If you identify that you don't want to go there, don't go there, but at least listen to it. That's, that's something that, yes, that's something that I have, I have learned. Excellent. And what other general advice would you give to founders of science startups, not just for raising funds, but in general of, on regards to that? The team. The team and don't try to do everything. It's, uh, I, think, I think that as scientists, we get too much into the details and we want to do everything. You cannot do that in a startup. Uh, and I think it's pretty, pretty, pretty hard to do things like that in life. You want to be able to, to delegate and you want to be able to, to find the right people to go along with you. Excellent. All right. Any uh, last words for this evening? Any last words? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, let's see. Yes, I think I think that's I, I I close with that. But I think I think that's the biggest thing is finding the team, selecting the team, and then then the money will come. If you want, if you have a really good idea, a really distilled idea, the money will come. Team and idea. Super important. Excellent. All right. Santiago, thank you very much. Jono, thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you to Delaware Innovation Space for hosting us, King Creative for doing the videography and our co-sponsors, the Delaware Sustainable Chemistry Alliance, Division of Small Business and Small Business Development Center. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jono. Thank you.